London. Good afternoon, dear friends. We continue our Denver's Media Forum. It's seventh edition. We are holding this event for seventh year in a row. This is a global event, very important for Ukraine. And now I would like to announce our last formal format of a discussion. So the thing is, if you take a look at the announcement, uh, I'm not here uh, mentioned as a moderator. However, all of our participants of this panel are located online. They join us via Zoom. My task now is to give the word over from the studio of Hromatske, where we are located right now, where the Denbals Media Forum is taking place, to Natalka Ohumenyuk, who will moderate this panel discussion. She's co-founder of uh, Suspine uh, Civil Interest Journalism lab. Natalka, I'm happy to see you online and I will be happy to see you offline as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Alexei, shall I start? Yes, I suggest that, I, that you start and then you will give it over to me at 4, 10 p.m. At 4 p.m., okay? Then you will give it over back to the studio. Thank you, Alexei, for the introduction. Today we will discuss uh, uh, the tolerance uh, sustainability of media and what unites Ukrainians from Luhansk to Lvov within the past 30 years, within the past few years. Today we will discuss will all, will all people who are interested in the key research which ARENA program has carried out uh, this, uh, the head of this program is Peter Pomerantsev and uh, the Laboratory of Interest of uh, Civil Society Journalists and all the people that I will present you here. This, is for, this research was focused on focus groups which were held on the non-governmental controlled territories of Ukraine. We asked uh, the opinion of, pe of people, uh, their attitude towards different events which have happened in Ukraine within the past 30 years. We wanted to understand what unites people and what sets them apart. In this case, we would like to focus on a research. It is called Ukrainian Turns 30 from the Independence to Co. Uh, correlations. It is available online, you can read that. And uh, we are focused here on discussing what is related to Donbass. We have a lot of uh, research uh, about what has happened to the myth so that Donbass feeds the entire Ukraine. Today we have with us Peter Pomerantsev, director of the RENA program and uh, senior fellow of AGORA program at Johns Hopkins University. We also have with us Angelina Karakina, editor and co-founder of Public Interest Journalism Lab. Angelina is also an editor at Suspirna. However, he is al she's also a core uh, researcher of this, uh, of this program. Uh, we also have with us Yaroslav Barbieri uh, from the University of Birgen Birmingham, Oksana Lemishka, an associate researcher at the Center for Sustainable Peace and Democratic Development, and Denise Kobzin, director of Kharkiv Institute for Social Research. The topic of this discussion is from Luhansk to Lviv. I, want also, I would also like to add that we are located everywhere. Denise is Kharkiv, I'm in Ushgorod, Angrina is Kiev, Oksana is in Ternopol, Yaroslav is in Bergen, Birmingham and Peter is in Washington. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this discussion, so we are happy to have it. Now I'd like to give it over to Peter and to ask my first question. What was the, the idea behind this research? Why do we need that? Peter, over to you. Yes. Natalia, thank you so much. I will speak Russian. I'm, I'm very sorry my uh, Ukrainian is not very bad, however, I do understand, or I think that I understand everything, however, I don't speak very well. It seems to me that at first it's necessary to explain why ARENA is doing what we do, because we are not a sociologist. We are uh, cameramen, editors, directors, journalists, writers, who wrote a lot about propaganda starting from 2014. My colleagues and I at ARENA, we have started 
noticing that something strange is going around the world in the US, in Russia, in Ukraine. As journalists, directors and writers, we understood that we don't understand our audience. We understood that all our our theory of change, our theory of success is built on uh, metaphors which are difficult to understand. It seems like we need to produce, to generate this positive information and it shall be more successful than bad propaganda. However, that's not the case. If you want good positive content to reach people, we need to understand these people better. There are a lot of approaches to do that. It seems to me that in journalism there is a shift towards the audience. This is an important shift. There is so-called engagement channels, engagement moment in the US, where the idea is that not journalists uh, choose the topic, they just follow the audience, uh, they uh, try to understand what is important to the audience. And there is this approach, which is more sociological, we try to understand at, at least something about our audience in order to engage in a dialogue with them. So this is an intro to, to, to our ideological approach. We get together sociologists and content creators, journalists and writers. These two areas have always worked in different uh, spheres, in different directions. We are not only sociologists, so it's not only a sociology researchers, which is needed to understand the country as a whole. It is very targeted. It has a clear goal. We need to understand how journalists, not only journalists, but also people who create uh, TV series, uh, create entertainment, how they can strengthen democracy and unity in Ukraine. The 30th anniversary of Ukraine was uh, a good chance to tackle those issues, to raise those important issues. For example, why people believe in conspiracy theories. These were the questions that we asked before. And here we have a wider topic. Uh, what unites and what separates Ukrainians in the past uh, 30 years? How we can create journalist content? and how we can create entertainment content, which might strengthen some of the central dynamics in the country. So that's exactly why I did that. We really hope that people will read our research, not just an interest in sociological statistics, but also as kind of a road map which they can use when developing a strategy uh, to create journalistic content. Was the right question, uh, the right answer? Thank you so much. I think that Denise will take it over. I think that most of us are interested. So, have you carried out this research on the non governmental control area? Can you please tell me how it happened? What was interesting to you? Uh, what were the challenges to you as a sociologist? Well, first, I was extremely happy that this project became possible because there are a lot of activities, a lot of projects. However, there are no projects uh, related to, to what unites uh, Ukrainians on both sides of the contact line. I had the opportunity to join this research work which will unite people. I think that we selected uh, the best methodology to dig up this uh, topic. This were focus groups, because focus group let us learn the... Because focus groups allow to study the internal, you know, mechanism of human beings and uh, make them talk up and to talk about those problems and events and themselves in these events. So that's why we had the focus group on controlled and non-controlled territories of Ukraine. Uh, any studies on non-controlled territories is always a challenge because a number of aspects, safety aspects including, and also the selection of people who would reflect some ideas which exist there 
uh, so that we could have a uh, true picture. But I think we succeeded because we dedicated a lot of attention to it. Plus, we had different categories. Those were inhabitants of big cities like Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, life of whom has changed, but not as radically as lives of uh, small settlements when everything was upside down. And also, we had a separate group, focus group, held with people who are who move from the uh, controlled to non-controlled and back. And they are in these two worlds. And they don't just do their tasks, but they are the kind of means of mass media for the wide circle of people telling there and there what's happening in reality. I think it's great that there is still a possibility to do uh, such, you know, surveys on these territories because working in Crimea, it, it shows that this open of opportunities is actually closing. And uh, on the non-controlled territories of Ukraine in Donetsk and Luhansk, it is still possible. Uh, I mean, in, uh, sorry, in, in the temporary occupied territories of Donetsk and Luhansk, it is still possible. And these people have reevaluated lots of things like uh, independence, peace, security, how the local myths have uh, debunked, what they are proud of today, and what they used to be proud of, without whom we couldn't have found out more a lot. I would like to add that there were 20, fo uh, 20 focus groups, and four of them were on non controlled territory, and they are also held in Zoom there. And Yaroslava Barbieri, who is one of the key authors who wrote the report. Yaroslava, the floor is yours. Please tell us which are the main, you know, achievements and uh, what, what have we found out out of this whole scope of information. Thank you, Natalia. I would start and say that, you know, the title of our panel discussion, as you can see, that it's uh, tolerance stability and dignity so how did we decide that these are the three pillars that unite ukrainians so the cliche in ukraine and out of ukraine is that ukraine is very much divided ethnically uh, you know linguistically from the side of the party policy but in our focus groups we found out that ukrainians think that the politicians are responsible responsible for the polarized polarization in, in, for example, use of language, but they think that they have the tolerant attitude on the languages. So, and then another is stability. Why stability? We found out that uh, Ukrainians feel, uh, you know, united around the experience of uh, um, disaster. And our respondents expressed a feeling of pride when they found out that Ukraine showed itself as a stable nation that is capable to go through certain challenges connected with different periods of process of gaining Ukrainian independence, just like in 1990s, which were very difficult from the economic point of view. But in fact, Ukrainians perceived positively its in their individual behavior in that period and dignity. There was a consensus among our respondents that Ukrainians are very proud uh, that as people they are ready to stand their own ground, their own position, their rights during such events like the, um, the uh, revolution of dignity. And what was also interesting that it was expressed by those who actively uh, supported the revolutions and uh, those who individually were not very active. But nevertheless, uh, this was the feeling of pride to stand their grounds. It was a common opinion of people from different political orientation. And another, another positive aspect of our uh, research is that Ukrainians are proud 
when they are seen as Ukrainians as a separate nation with their own culture, language, abroad. And that was on the level of individual experience at the airport or during some school Olympiads wins, victories, or when people see uh, on the TV that uh, uh, Ukrainians win the Eurovision or in sports competition. Of course, we I presented the positive aspects, but it's uh, I have to also mention some negative conclusions we dr made during our focus groups. First thing, there is a weak feeling of interdependence between different regions. But what is interesting, this point of view was expressed by the older age groups, but the younger respondents who probably had uh, more possibility to travel in the country, they expressed positive saying that different corners of the country, they are interdependent and they need each other from the cultural, political and economic point of view. And indeed, this feeling of weak interdependence inside of the country was also perceived on the level of the international among uh, a lot of our respondents they said that the independence of Ukraine equals to uh, you know independence from any international liabilities they do not want to be dependent upon Russian gas or any international you know um, money uh, but it is necessary to promote that interdependence is the key ingredient of independence and the driver of development in the 21st century. And what about Donbass? What did you find, speaking of, uh, in the format of Donbass Media Forum, this was the last item I wanted to speak about. The majority of our participants from the temporarily occupied territories expressed the feeling of being abandoned by Ukraine or Russia and there was a consensus that they were seeking to go back to some uh, certain form of normality from the point of view of peace and also knowing their political status. So these people feel isolated from all like they are abandoned and because of the long-lasting situation of being in in this non-defined status where they feel uh, uh, like hostages. Uh, it's difficult to understand the feelings of belonging and this must be addressed and we have to show why we need each other. That's what I think is the key challenge that is in front of us. We shall speak more and each has every something to say. Oksana Lemichka used to work as a sociologist for a long time, including the project Seeds with the topic of Donbass. And you had the possibility to take a look at the previous research made on the, uh, uh, those territories. What has surprised you now? What is already perceived as cliche, but we found out some things that were unexpected. Oksana, turn on your mic. Uh, Natalia, thank you for your speech. A lot has been said what has surprised, but I shall repeat myself maybe. But I want to be well structured. Most, the most, uh, I was surprised the most by absence of interdependence on the personal and international level. My favorite quote uh, where I repeat, uh, that, uh, you know, potatoes grows everywhere and people don't understand why one oblast needs another oblast. And another thing that surprised me, that we have several oblasts, everyone, everyone is discussing Kiev, Odessa, Lviv, and other oblasts seem to be not on the map of Ukraine. Even youth that is traveling, they don't tell about other oblasts. And we understand it even on the mental map of Ukraine, a lot has been has to be done locally and nationally for Ukraine to flourish in all colors. This is the first thing that surprised me. The people don't even mention other oblasts. I was also surprised by the tolerance that Yaroslava has told us about. 
because we were very tolerant towards uh, the languages from our respondents from the east to the west all people tried to support each other when we asked about about uh, Bandera and many others, uh, the respondents in isolated groups, they understood this question which is related to history. That is why I think we need to use all this resource for the future. People are very tolerant. Uh, we even researched the uh, so-called Soviet nostalgia. Uh, we said that uh, we need to talk about uh, the past from the point of view for the future. And it turned out that people were quite tolerant. As for the independence and codependence, uh, we had warmed up, uh, warm up questions. You know, when people ask questions just to uh, cheer people up, uh, so they uh, feel more comfortable. So we asked them uh, their thoughts on happiness, on the future. For me, this was a know-how. It was uh, what I really like doing after after seeing that people don't feel individual responsibility for their own life, for their own happiness, and for their own future. This paternalism. This is what prevents uh, them implementing their potential. So, you are speaking of, interna of uh, national paternalism, because we are speaking here of the Mass Media Forum, and there are thoughts that paternalism, this is something which is typical to the East. No, that's definitely a national thing. It's uh, not only relevant for the East. <clears throat> when we ask the uh, senior population uh, what your goals in life, what happiness means to you, uh, what do you think about your future? We were shocked with the answers because we saw that they felt this individual lack of responsibility for their own life. It seems that they were not responsible for their own life. That is why they couldn't take responsibility for the life of the community. That is why we need to work uh, on an individual level so people understand that we are codependent on each other, that uh, a lot depends on us. Last but not least, when we asked what you are proud of as a Ukrainian, in addition to international recognition, there was nothing. No Shevchenko, no Lesa Ukraina, no Ivan Boychuk, no Ivan Marchuk, no contemporary uh, celebrities. This feeling of being proud of Ukraine is uh, related uh, to international recognition. It means that there is a vacuum in the society. We need to discuss that. We need to discuss what Ukraine means to people without international recognition. Probably Denise will add to what I started. I really loved our focus groups on the non-governmental controlled territories. Let me tell you the truth. Uh, according to our research, there are two groups in Ukraine. These are that people are suspicious of. Uh, these are politicians, because if you become a politician, uh, you uh, change uh, at once, and uh, Ukrainians try to uh, distance from the authorities. And second group that people are suspicious of, uh, these are people from the non-controlled territories. Uh, we have several excellent quotes from our research. People from the non-governmental control areas who started getting disappointed uh, with the local authorities uh, started being disappointed with this myth that Donbass feeds the entire Ukraine. We had respondents uh, who were speaking of democracy as the foundation for a contemporary state. I understand that people are listening to me and uh, they have a lot of questions to the methodology. I understand that uh, the effect of a sample. However, I am happy that uh, this contact line that we are speaking of is doesn't differentiate people that much. And uh, the results of this research were quite promising to me. But we'll get back to that. Angelina, now I would like to ask you, because in our research we also provide recommendations, as media experts and journalists, especially those journalists that work with the topic of the conflict of the war, how they can use uh, the results of this research? Uh, you asked uh, our speakers what impressed or surprised them. To me, as a person who works uh, with news, it wasn't 
rather sad or disappointing. Well, it, it was a little bit disappointing, I must tell you the truth, to see once again that people are looking for entertainment, uh, for um, uh, entertainment, for uh, celebrities, for pop culture. There is uh, a huge potential for changes. Largely, when we spoke to people who were looking, uh, who were watching TV, who consume entertainment, uh, YouTube channels or social media, people are looking for entertainment. So this might be travel blogs, entertainment materials. They were looking for consolation. Unfortunately, uh, there are very few competitors in Ukrainian content. It seems to me that we need to fight for the attention of our audience to provide them enough entertainment materials. As for the results of this research, uh, they uh, make us think of many different new formats. And now I will get back to the question of codependence. So this was one of the key questions in our research. We recommend to think about different uh, formats, media formats from a talk show to documentaries or TV series of different formats that would tell the audience how Ukrainians from different regions of Ukraine with different background, social status, education level, how they build together something, or how they are joining forces, how they, for example, develop a business or reach a goal. These narratives uh, are very easy to use in entertainment genres. So I think it's, we, we pr for example, we can make a TV series about how people are joining their forces to reach a joint goal. We also recommend to those uh, who are working in the news journalism is uh, to use new methods of engaging the audience because sometimes we hear that people do mistrust the audience mistrust the journalists they feel that their voices are not heard that is why i'd recommend to use a couple of tools which would help those people feel they can make an impact they can influence the content produced by the media these are the practices of uh, open doors open meetings uh, uh, opinion polls, uh, calls, hotlines. There are a lot of uh, methods to engage the audience and I think that each media outlet can use a tool like that. Let me also reiterate, it is very important uh, to tell stories about Ukrainians uh, who uh, achieved success, who, for example, work in big corporations, who uh, win medals uh, in Olympic Games, uh, who achieve success in, in a particular area. Such stories give people inspiration, they inspire them, uh, it uh, gives people consolation and uh, they also are proud when they uh, read such stories. I'd like to ask Denise, because at the beginning of our conversation, you said that you had very concrete conclusions as uh, sociological conclusions about the myth. So I give it over. What do you think will be useful for journalists? What I deem interesting is not always interesting to others. However, I do suggest to read our report. It's very interesting. There are a lot of interesting quotes, which when I was speaking of the non-governmental controlled areas, what is important to notice is that decentralization, which is seen by the governmental control Ukraine as an achievement that have uh, been there during all the years of the independence. For example, people who lived back in Soviet times, they say that before to solve an issue, to tackle a problem, you needed to, to uh, do that in Moscow, in Kiev, and now I 
can go uh, reach out to the head of the territorial community so they think that this is a great achievement over the um, uh, recent years of independence as for the decentralization of the non-governmental control territories it became probably one of the most uh, traumatizing events so first the soviet union collapsed and miners who lived quite well in soviet times they lost a lot they lost their jobs they lost their money and then 2014 was seen by many local inhabitants as a step to de decentralization and for these people it came as a shock and we need to take the to account we need to discuss that second there is an increase in information isolation of this region from both sides from the ukrainian and russian sides those people want to get to know more how people lived on the occupied territories they don't know how to do that because they mostly use uh, cliches which are not uh, interested to the audience and uh, something similar happens on the non-governmental controlled uh, areas uh, journalists use a lot of cliches so these people don't know how ukraine lives right now so of course uh, people want to know how their neighbors live and the people from the occupied territories they want to get to know how people from the mainland ukraine see them can you please explain us about the myth that Donbass feeds Ukraine? Because we uh, started talking about it at the beginning of our conversation. This myth was debunked. There is no this myth. Now there is kind of nostalgia for this golden period when Donbass fed all Ukraine. For people, this is a depressive factor. On the other hand, this is an excellent opportunity to build something new. Ukraine can use this vacuum, this gap. Ukraine can build something here. Explain why Ukraine needs Donbass. I see that as a positive sign, as a potential opportunity, because those myths some of the myths are not myths part of the national identity is that people in Donbass are very hard working they are very patient they can uh, do their best to reach an idea to reach a goal that is why ukraine needs them i would like to raise another issue which is cutting through what we see in the east of ukraine is this uh, need for normality because in contrast to the rest of ukraine the war has become the most traumatizing event i would like to ask peter what in your opinion are the uh, characteristics of this normalcy what media can offer inhabitants of the east of ukraine speaking of this normality what do you mean by normality or normalcy if other speakers want to add uh, to that uh, please you're welcome uh, dear participants dear viewers if you have any questions please do ask thank you you must understand that what media can do it has uh, limitation it has its limits the media cannot magically change the situation in Donbass. It's important to understand two things. First, that the audience, uh, that uh, these territories are not lost. There are a lot of people who are open to contact. And we need to understand the role the media can play how we can engage those audiences so they feel that their voices are heard and we must understand what kind of service we can provide them it seems to me that the media needs uh, to transform into the direction of providing services so what are the services that we can offer those people through the media so they are engaged into the life of the ukraine into ukrainian life we are speaking of very practical things how do we work with this nostalgia to peaceful life until 2014 
It seems to me that uh, different uh, TV programs tell a lot about life and mass culture in the independent Ukraine. Uh, they can uh, be very popular there. We noticed in our focus groups that people are very attached to the uh, their memories connected with the television, music, pop culture, with the Ukrainian popular culture for the past 30 years. It's like, you know, the uh, possibility to start the conversation. Another event, which was loud, it was Euro 2012, especially in the East because it was about the international recognition and involvement of East and West and some cooperation and it's this year will have the uh, 10th anniversary in 2022. It's also another interesting topic but I would like to ask Yaroslava first because we give the term in our recommendation which is recognition but recognition is when the foreigners talk well about you but as far as I understand recognition is when people see themselves on the screen and uh, it, we notice that people from the non-controlled territories of Ukraine they don't see themselves in the, on the screen so how to work with this recognition what is it yes indeed from the point of view of uh, Euro 2012 why was it very relevant for our participants on the temporarily occupied territories? Because with nostalgia, they were reminiscing those events uh, when many people arrived and they see Ukraine as a normal country and foreigners were very, you know, you know, they were very friendly and they could see that finally this was the country that was recognized where you can communicate with all the world which con is in contrast with today's feeling of being abandoned so I think 2022 can be a good occasion to remind how the East was also part of this process of gaining recognition in Ukraine and internationally on the screen. I previously spoke about the Olympiad and international sports competition and uh, Euromaidan, but there was a consensus that people were very happy to mention when Ukrainian sportsmen or singers but winning in these international competitions to see on the screen that this is a unique country and it is winning. But going back to the topic of temporarily occupied territories and the role of media, indeed there is lack of a dignified representativeness of people on the temporarily occupied territory. You could feel this stereotype in the rest of the country that those were just passive, that people on the temporarily occupied territories, they take passively Russian propaganda and they have no feeling of agency. I think this stereotype is to be changed because it doesn't favor the feeling of normality and interdependence. We need to get this back of the moment of human humanity. Oksana paid attention to tolerance and if to be more exact, how was it expressed in the sensitive subject? Tolerance. Two examples, I always quote them. Um, when we spoke about Bandera and in the East we were told, yes, if they have Bandera there, let him be there. It's a quote out of context. We had other quotes. We also asked for you about Ukrainian or Russian language. Uh, to be used for programs, the respondents of the Western Ukraine to do it in Ukrainian, but we understand that not everyone understands Ukrainian, that maybe you can do it in Russian as well. And that shows about readiness of people to leave past in the past and to move forward and readiness to understand each other. And when we approach this humane level, 
they all try to into take into account or maybe it's just people wanted to show their better side you have to understand that the opinion is not always uh, shown in the behavior but in all groups in the country there was a try of each respondent to understand what it's like for those living in another oblast or on that territory which is nice of course they were all blaming the politicians in this split up but this tolerance and acceptance which is a strong side of ukraine and it can be worked with uh, um, you also mentioned about the format of some entertaining uh, journalism but what about thematic we saw how much people want to hear so see the research was done in commemoration of the 30th anniversary of independence and it said that like everything was destroyed in the mass media but we said that not everything got destroyed some new businesses emerged big enterprises emerged and i remember uh, one uh, a woman f mentioned that she wanted her child not to see the plane so it is important for them to see not big uh, small business develop and what are the topics and i see Oleksii that wants to remind us nine minutes from now we have to finish yes i'm here and there's a reason for that and indeed you have nine more minutes Please stick to the agenda. Thank you for reminding it, Alexei. Indeed, you partly mentioned about this, that times of uh, gaining independence in the 90s often perceived or maybe are depicted by popular media as lost years, you know. Like everything, when everything that was uh, accumulated uh, disappeared but it's not like that in reality and one of our recommendation was to take a look at those practices businesses and institutions which emerged for this time for 30 years and there in these stories there is everything we are mentioning stories about interdependence about uh, stability by the way uh, stability or resilience going back to the topic of myths which thanks to this research we managed to debunk myth that ukrainians are united about memory united by memories about bad times but it's uh, how it's not it's how they were surviving them what they're remembering like the experience they were gaining during it and how they moved on and here i cannot help not to speak about uh, the uh, people who uh, had to uh, quit their profession and uh, somebody has grew grown professionally thanks to this and get some new knowledge so it depends a lot upon the optics i would say one paradox thing we now spoke about this inquiry for normality when young people on the non-controlled territories they consume youtube and the russian content mostly but they said that they it was an interesting for me to see for them authority is harry style singer and someone else so they go there that part of russian media is something progressive and european while ukrainian media is something difficult about war and very negative and very heavy about something that is abstract yes and that is why we can definitely say here that it's incorrect russia is perceived as something more progressive and i i'm asking dennis uh, to show this big difference that we can see between the uh, the older and younger generation and from the point of view of the media that people said that they were consuming which are uh, the uh, results well i would like to say that the older generation is not a homogeneous group but there are people who have uh, nostalgia for ukraine 
and maybe they are in majority, but there are also people who associate themselves with Russia and uh, they all have their own ideas on the future of the region. As for the youth, in fact, they do not have the ideological coloring of what they find interesting. They just follow something that's uh, most fun. So any fun content can be it can be used to uh, promote this audience. We have a final remarks. So one more time, in what other way can journalists work with this? Yaroslava. It was a long project and we have learned a lot. It sometimes is difficult to focus on some separate issues, but in fact, one of the conclusions that impressed me the most is the feeling of international recognition because Ukraine has been mentioned by other countries and then when we find out that Ukrainians are proud they are seen as a separate culture political reality I think that internally Ukrainian media are to promote and emphasize on the figures Ukrainians can be proud of which contribution some of those personalities made for Ukrainian history or for the international context and I think we don't do it um, enough so a lot what can be done in here inside of the country and not only and the last question it's uh, for you Peter could you please also conclude it's um, about other researchers uh, it's important for this idea to also be voiced speaking about East a lot mention about propaganda and disinformation we have just said how we can uh, you know get acquainted with this audience better but we saw that some concerns uh, that people have they can be legitimate so if we sum up what would the advice be how much can be achieved with the fight with fakes itself and what can be done apart from this apart from studying the audience if we speak about the audience how can we work with that audience that doesn't trust you already mentioned the key word trust the word that we use quite often but we don't really understand what we mean uh, of course we have to fight fakes and show where disinformation exists but if it's a strategic reply we have to fight the effects of these fakes a lot of fakes are uh, just trash and it's hard to be distracted on some uh, small ideas but it's their effect and how to fight its effect and this effect is very often aiming this to kill the feeling of subjectivity so people would feel they live in chaos and it's everything is dangerous and to kill the feeling of trust trust to what trust to democracy I would say the feeling that you can play an active role that's what it is necessary to work with which role can media play in enhancing citizen activity and many approaches can be here yeah, to think about this the journalism is rethinking itself often for its life for several centuries it's rethinking its goal and but the goal is always the same how to enhance the public sphere 
and our goal now has changed a bit if before we had the goal to win uh, the censorship and tell the truth and it was enough now it's not no. we need to understand our role in democratic processes we need to understand what we can do I think that's that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, we need to wrap up our discussion. Dear friend, thank you so much for taking part in it. Let me remind you that you can follow the link which you see on the website of Donbass Media Forum. And let me give it over to Oleksii Matsuca, Matsuka, who will continue our discussion. Thank you so much for your work and uh, stay with us. We hope that our discussion was useful. Natalka, thank you so much, dear colleagues. I was happy to see all of you online. I hope that we will see each other in person very soon. We will continue our conversation, our Donbass Media Forum 2021. At 16.10, we will start next panel discussion with quite an attractive title. Who? Oh, who? How and uh, does it really threaten free speech in Ukraine?